there is no such thing as a dull week in international relations but for india this week has begun in a particularly eventful and busy manner not because of what happened in pakistan although that's also important or what's happening in ukraine but because india and the us had the fourth edition of their 2 plus 2 ministerial meeting 2 plus 2 why because this is a forum where the defense minister and the foreign minister from either side together they meet so this is the fourth why defense and foreign ministers because this is meant to oversee this developing evolving strategic partnership between the two most important democracies in the world now just preceding this was also a virtual summit uh, between prime minister modi from india and president joe biden now you've seen pro forma statements released by either side the opening address by the prime minister and by the president those things are a public consumption usually full of platitudes now the important thing is that this this round of 2 plus 2 has taken place in the backdrop of what's happened in ukraine it's almost been 7 weeks in fact we are in the 7th week now of the russian invasion of ukraine in the course of which we have seen that india india and the us have not been fully on the same page on this issue for example us and its allies nato and elsewhere even the other two quad allies that's japan and australia they have voted in favor of all the resolutions that the americans have supported against russia or let me say they voted in all the resolutions against russia india on the other hand has abstained india has abstained and that has led to a lot of complaints particularly from the from the commentators from the media in these countries saying india is letting its own side down india is not speaking of a democracies india has however had a very nuanced stand india has been underlining the need to preserve and protect and respect ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty but at the same time not condemning russia again on this on sanctions against russia india's view is very qualified because as we keep explaining to you if 98% 96% of all your tanks are of russian origin and if 72% of your fighter planes are of russian origin if 95% of your surface to air missiles to shoot down aircraft and missiles are of russian origin and if the flagship of your navy is of russian origin and every flying asset on it is of russian origin there are limitations to how far you can go with immediate sanctions against russia now there's been a lot of speculation suspicion what will happen suspicion among those who might worry that look this 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 can upset the strategic shift that india made i would say from 19 80 onwards now i'm not going into the history of that but the fact is that when mrs gandhi came back to power in 1980 she was uneasy and that is that is a well documented fact she was quite uneasy for the way india was being forced to vote at the un on the soviet invasion of afghanistan so it's not the first time soviet union or now russia it's it's inheritor inheritor of its legacy they have put india to such a big moral test 1979 they invaded afghanistan and really at this point at that point india had no choice but to vote in a manner that suited the soviets that's mean that means abstaining on most of those votes now she was uneasy and she reached out to ronald reagan at cancun that is a well documented initiative on her part to break the ice with the americans she was trying to thaw what had frozen in 1971 in the nixon kissinger period after that the progress has been very slow rajiv gandhi made some movements but once again once he was he was in trouble he blamed the americans without directly naming them but he said wo log jo bahar se plan kar rahe hain all those who who are plotting against me from outside hum unko nani yaad dila denge not very different uh, from what imran khan was saying just the other day blaming the americans for all his problems so america is the usual suspect in our countries now i say 1991 because 1989 to 1991 is when the cold war ended and india had to figure out its place 
in this new world. So see, the first initiative was taken by Chandrasekhar. Chandrasekhar, who had who had a government with very few numbers, just 40 MPs of his own supported by Congress from outside. And he at that point, when the first Gulf War started in 1991, when the first Gulf War started, after Saddam had occupied Kuwait, he allowed American aircraft refueling facilities in India. These were aircraft mostly taking off from Diego Garcia and going towards the Gulf. As soon as that fact came out, there was a lot of noise in the Indian political system. It would have got the Congress also at that point quite uneasy. Then Narsimha Rao it is who came in in the same year 1991, who took many initiatives, the first of which was upgrading his relations with Israel. That was the first indication that India was shifting away from the Cold War, larger Cold War formulation of its foreign policy. Now, since then, India has had the pretense of non-alignment or still being part of a non-aligned movement, but increasingly, prime minister to prime minister, India and US, India and the Western world, particularly the US, have moved closer. And it's a consistent movement. You can say the graph started in 1980 somewhere here and moving at this pace and this pace and this pace. Then under Manmohan Singh, it became even steeper. Remember, it was in his first term that he signed the Indo-US Indo nuclear deal. And then under Narendra Modi, it has become quite a vertical graph. So in that situation, there was also a concern or on the other side, uh, the critics, a hope maybe that this will finally remind India that America was not a friend or ally, that India's interests lay either with Soviet bloc and somehow that Putin's Russia was the true inheritor of the Soviet legacy. So it was the new Soviet Union. And India had once again come back to that old fake non-alignment, but it was more or less an ally of the Soviet Union, but pretended to be non-aligned. I'm digressing, but this only came to my mind because Sonia Gandhi the other day addressing her party leader said, see, we have now realized the value of true non-alignment. The fact is true non-alignment never existed, not after 1969 when Indira Gandhi signed the Treaty of Peace, Friendship and Cooperation, as it was called with the Soviet Union. And every government in India over the past 40 years has tried to distance itself from that formulation of non-alignment, which is what's happened now. So the question was, will this stand the test of the Ukraine-Russia problem? That would India now be expected to completely be with the other allies, the Quad allies in particular, or would India still have the space? I'm not saying allowed. No country is allowed. Countries make their choices. India makes its choice. India is too big and too powerful and too important a country for other countries to say, you shall not be allowed to, to, to do this in terms of its sovereign choices. But there is now, it's evident from this 2 plus 2 that there is adequate understanding of where India is coming from. So, for example, even if you saw... Uh, the big headline event and the video that's gone viral is a short statement by our foreign minister S.J. Shankar where he says, if you're talking, talking about our oil purchases from Russia, we buy some energy from Russia, but what we buy in a month is perhaps less than what Europe buys in an afternoon. That's true and everybody knows it. So once again, it's not as if the whole world or India's own allies are putting the gun or India's head and saying, listen, you stop buying any oil from Russia or I pull the trigger. No, first of all, nobody can do it. And second, that is not the situation because Europe is buying a lot. Yes, there will be an issue when India buys large amounts of deep discounted oil because that can be seen by India's allies as profiting from an unfair war. Or if India becomes party to alt alternate payment mechanisms to get around the sanctions. But we haven't yet got there. So when we get there, we'll see what happens. Now, if you, if you get this noise out, if you get this noise out, see what do this, what, what have these meetings achieved. And you know, when diplomats write stuff, mostly it looks like platitudes and repetition. That's why you have to read very, very carefully between the lines. And for heaven's sake, don't watch what the TV is saying. 
right? Uh, so on the one hand, there is TV saying, I saw one channel even saying, oh, will Biden now concede to Modi? Now these talks don't have, no, don't take, these talks don't take place like that. And large nations, large powers don't deal with each other, don't interact like that. So what I can do is, the best I can do is read these statements. Now you can see that Indian statements, both ministers, S. Jai Shankar and Rajnath Singh. Rajnath Singh, if anything, is even more cautious than any diplomat. They have completely avoided mentioning Russia in any situation. Even the readout of the Prime Minister and President's uh, summit meeting, Indian readout has no mention of Russia or China. The American readout has a mention of Russia. So Russia was discussed, but obviously Indians don't want to state it. But unless the Americans had India's conference, they would not have stated in their readout that Russia was discussed. Similarly, in the statements, opening statements, and also at the press conference, by the American ministers, that is Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State, both Russia and China are mentioned. And that's the important part. Because even from the Indian side, in none of the statements is China mentioned. Even in the joint statement also, they are walking over eggshells. India does not like to directly name or blame China anywhere. Now, a lot of people say that, look, what have the Americans done for you? Chinese are giving you trouble in Ladakh. Americans haven't even spoken out in your favor. The, the fact is, Americans have spoken out a lot more. Now, definitely, you can argue and I will also argue that they are doing it not in our interest. They are doing it in their interest. But remember the national interest we wrote three weeks back that in foreign policy, every country acts in its own national interest. So if you see this statement, after all the regular stuff like science, technology, uh, vaccines, cybersecurity, climate change, infrastructure, space, there is a mention of critical and emerging technologies. And then when it talks about defense, in fact, the longest section in the joint statement is about defense. When they talk about defense and strategic partnership, then they say that, look, this is a comprehensive global strategic partnership, which encompasses all areas of science, technology, cybersecurity, and space. And then it goes on to say that India and America now are major defense partners. That's very important. And it says the statement, they will coordinate closely. Uh, there is an Indo-US joint tech group which keeps meeting and which is, which is studying evolving new defense domains including space and artificial intelligence. All these are important things. Important things are not kitne tank or mulre mil rahe or kitne anti-tank missile or mil rahe. These are the important things because that's how warfare will happen now. This is the changing nature of warfare. Again, the two sides noted their progress in what is called as Beka. Now, Beka, we had done an earlier Cut the Clutter episode and maybe this Sunday, uh, I will share with you once again an edited shortened version of it just for reference because that was some time back. So Beka is one of the agreements, military slash strategic agreements that India and US have signed lately. And that is Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement. Now Basic Exchange and Cooperation Agreement actually involves a very high level exchange of information and, uh, and lots of other details. I recommend to you, please watch that episode this Sunday. That will give you a much better background instead of my going on and on right now. Then they say, and these are again interested in, uh, and these are again interesting formulations, combined maritime forces, that India should be a part of combined maritime forces task force of essentially the Quad allies and the Western allies in Indo-Pacific. And then it mentions all the exercises that go on, Yudh Abhyas, Vajra Prahar, Cope India, Red Flag. These are the two Air Force exercises, Cope India is in India, Red Flag is in America. Then very significantly a line, both sides commit to deepening cooperation between special forces. You know what that means, because special forces need special equipment, special technologies, special ability to use artificial intelligence and information technology, training, etc., talk trains, etc., etc. 
two sides are also talking about strengthening DT, uh, DTTI, that is Defense Technology and Trade Initiative. And then there is a lot about joint production where American companies and American technology could come in to help to, or to participate in Make in India projects. There, the mentions I find interesting again, first of all, co-developed, air-launched, unarmed vehicles, important. That is unarmed vehicles which are la launched by aircraft. Number two, counter unmanned aerial systems. That means when someone else is using unarmed U vehicles, UAVs against you or drones against you, how do you counter them? That is the new technology because that's how warfare functions. There are electronic measures, electronic countermeasures, then electronic counter countermeasures and then it, go it goes on like that. So this is counter unmanned aerial systems. Then the joint development of what is called as I-STAR systems, I-S-T-A-R. What does that stand for? Intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition and reconnaissance. So these platforms have to be developed and these will be developed jointly. Also the two sides are going to sign industrial security agreements. That is to make sure that no, sign has, uh, no side has any anxieties. What happens if I share my critical technologies with the other side? This works obviously more to the benefit of India. And there are two other things which look like, I would say, sweeteners given to India. One, that US Navy ships, particularly of the Sea Lift Command, these are not combat ships. These are ships that carry a large number of troops and tanks and equipment. So ships of the US Sea Lift Command, Maritime Sea Lift Command, they will choose one or more of Indian ports for their maintenance, repair, etc., etc., or their mid-voyage repairs because they're making a long voyage, they need uh, repairs on the way so they can do it on an Indian port. Now, having said this, I'd mentioned China earlier. Now, the mention of China, if you read the statement by Lloyd Austin, who is the US Secretary of Defense, that I find very, very, very significant. So he says, across the region, PRC is creating new challenges, urgent and mounting challenges to our shared vision. That is India and the US's shared vision by way of redefining, seeking to redefine other states' sovereignty. And then he again says, and I quote from his statement, Beijing is eroding the security of the Indo-Pacific region from its construction of dual use infrastructure on your border. That's on our border. Once again, India is very cagey. India is not complaining because you don't, don't want to poke the Chinese in the eye. But the Americans have no such problem. Beijing is eroding the security of the Indo-Pacific region from its construction of dual use infrastructure on your border to its unlawful claim in South China seas. And Lloyd Austin says, we will continue to stand alongside you as you defend your sovereign interests. Now, Okay, you might say, Are, America ne to kahani ke, I will come and fight for you. Nobody comes and fights for you. Ukrainians are fighting for themselves. A sovereign nation has to fight for itself. You need solidarity. You need sharing of information. You might need equipment. Uh, you might need all kinds of diplomatic support, right? That is what big nations do for each other. They don't send their armies. They are not expected, expected to send their armies to defend others. Plus, India is too powerful, too strong, too self-respecting and too confident to need any such help from anybody. Then he goes on and he mentions about Russian, equation, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, which obviously India does not talk about. And he says in his statement, Lloyd Austin says, as Indian armed forces become more jointly integrated, our militaries will work together across domains of potential conflict from seas to cyberspace. Now, what does all that, what does all of that mean? You can translate it. I don't have it. I don't have to do it for you. Now, the other thing that I find very significant in this, and I think you will see a story from Snehesh Alex Philip, our defense editor in the course of time on this, that is a new agreement that India and US have agreed to sign now. And that is called SSAA. All these are interesting uh, acronyms which will keep featuring in our lives like LEMOA, CATSA, COMCASA. CATSA is trouble, COMCASA is not trouble. Uh, now, SSAA is Space Situational Awareness Agreement. Now, that is, that is what India and 
the US are going to sign. That is an agreement US has signed with many countries. I was Googling it and I found they've signed one with Japan on this and I'm sharing with you a copy. You can see that. I don't know exactly how our agreement will be, but it'll be something like that. Now, I've also checked out the definition of space situational awareness and you will see that on the screen. I will also share a link from Space Foundation for you for better understanding. So you can see where the two countries are headed. This is basically, so one country can share with the other all information of floating objects in outer space, particularly debris, etc. So what you say, what you call debris could, could be weapons, anything that threatens your satellites or your assets in space. You now share information on those. That's a very significant agreement. Once again, Lloyd Austin, uh, you can expect a defense person, a general to talk a lot more lot more directly than diplomats. Diplomats are much too cautious unless a di diplomat is Pompeo, uh, which Blinken isn't. He says PRC, that is People's Republic of China, is seeking to refashion the region and the institutional system more broadly in ways that ser serve its authoritarian interests. Right? That's really like gi giving gali to the Chinese. But as we operationalize our defense agreements, and take our cooperation to the next level, I believe that we can sustain and strengthen a favorable balance of power in the region. So if you see all of this, then it doesn't look like there is a lot of tutu meme going on there, or there is a lot of aapne ye kya kya, how could you do to me, et to India, because you know, as we keep on saying again and again, nations act in their self-interest. And the larger the nation, the stronger that commitment to self-interest and also larger the stakes. And that is what comes out of these meetings. So once again, these meetings are not about why did you buy so many more barrels of uh, oil from crude oil from Russia or why did you abstain at the last vote? These are, these are about the most substantive aspect of India-US strategic partnership.